this is a very important class uh, in pediatrics. Many pediatricians okay, strongly believe there is a huge role of breastfeeding uh, uh, if we talk about the health of the kids or the children. If we strictly follow breastfeeding all over the world, then the chance of having infection in the children will be very minimal, especially respiratory tract infection and GI tract infection, because breastfeeding can actively prevent or protect those kids against those infections. So with this, let me enter into the topic. Now, all of you, uh, please focus here. What are the general guidelines about infant and young child feeding first? See there? So those important guidelines are prefer delivery in baby-friendly hospital. This is a concept given by WHO and UNICEF, Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative. That means after the delivery, there has to be a breastfeeding within half an hour or as soon as possible. And only breastfeeding, nothing else. Put the baby to the breast within half an hour after a normal delivery and within four to six hours after a cesarean delivery. See there. This is a very strict guideline. After half an hour of a normal delivery and within four to six hours after a cesarean delivery. Now, why cesarean delivery may take up to four to six hours? Why? Anybody? Because uh, some uh, use of medications uh, in the mother during uh, cesarean section. That's why it's avoided. You're right. It's absolutely correct. Sometimes we give some sedative drug to the mother. Sometimes we do cesarean section under general anesthesia also. So the mother is not uh, completely awake. So she cannot feed the baby. But still, you know, even in that situation, the nurses can help uh, the baby to feed. They, they have to take the baby uh, to the breast of the mother and the baby can still suck. So though it is written, within four to six hours after the cesarean delivery, it can be done quite earlier, uh, maybe after half an hour to one hour after the delivery also, okay? But she cannot do this actively from her side. Somebody should help her. Another point, encourage the intake of colostrum as the first and subsequent feed. Now, colostrum is the, is the first discharge from the breast after the birth of the baby. It is quite thick. Okay, it is quite thick and slightly yellow. And many of the people believe, you know, this is not a good type of milk and they will discard it. But remember, this is one of the very, very important part of the milk, okay, for the baby. It has got a lot of antibody. So we should not discard it. Another important guideline, avoid the pre-lacteal feeds like water, like glucose water, or honey water, or even artificial milk. All of these are avoided. In many different countries, especially if the baby is delivered at home, you know, what they do? They do these type of things. Okay. So we should never promote this type of things after the birth of the baby. What is the danger? If we feed the baby with these things, yes, what is the danger? Anyone? Chances of infection, sir. Exactly. Abbas, I strongly agree with you. Yeah. There is a chance of infection. There's a chance of infection, and this is not a very good practice, also. Especially honey. Okay. We have seen in different communities or different societies, you know, honey is given to the baby. That honey may be uh, contaminated with spores of Clostridium botulinum. And this is known as botulism in the baby. This is known as intestinal botulism. That uh, spore of the clostridium botulinum may go inside the GI tract, okay? And it may germinate there. It may uh, convert into the active vegetative form of the bacteria. It may produce a powerful exotoxin. You all know that is known as botulinum toxin. 
that botulinum toxin may cause paralysis of that newborn baby. So these things are not usually given. Practice exclusively breastfeeding for six months of the life followed by sequential addition of semi-solid and solid food to complement, not replace the breast milk till child is able to eat normal family food after one year. This is a very, very important concept. So let me, uh, you know, uh, discuss this a little bit here. Exclusive breastfeeding for six months of life. Even water is not allowed. Forget about other thing. Even water is not allowed in case of exclusive breastfeeding. The mother's milk is enough for the baby till six months of life. But after that, what the family should do? They should introduce a new food. Okay, in the beginning, it should be semi-solid and later on, it should be solid food. But you should not replace the breast milk completely. This is known as complementary food, not the supplementary one. Complementary means you continue to breastfeed the baby at the same time, you give some additional food, okay? Till the baby becomes two years of age. And we, we want uh, those mother to breastfeed the baby till two years of age. For six months, only breastfeeding. After that, other food are also given along with breast milk. This is very, very important point. Let's move on. Now, let's talk a little bit about this exclusive breastfeeding concept, okay? Now, this is like a revision for you. Exclusive breastfeeding, what's the meaning? Old Health Organization and UNICEF. Okay, UNICEF is United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF. And other health agencies recommend that a mothers breastfeed their babies exclusively for the first six months after the birth of the baby and continue breastfeeding together with giving other food and drinks up to two years of the life, or even more if it is possible. But up to for six months, only breastfeeding. Now, one small question there. If a baby becomes sick or ill, what about the medicine? If we give medicine, okay, is that Consider inside the exclusive breastfeeding or the exclusive breastfeeding is disturbed now uh, after giving medicine. What is your idea or opinion? Yes? Sir, I think it will be disturbed some meaning. It will be continued because they also provide some immunity to child. Sir, maybe yeah? it will not disturb. Now, so, so I am getting different answers here. Okay, probably you have not, uh, you know, gone through this uh, before, isn't it? So, never mind. Medicine is an exception in the exclusive breastfeeding. Even if we give medicine, the exclusive breastfeeding it still remains. It is not disturbed. But apart from that, anything else, if the family give, like water, a bit of honey, you know, other type of things. Uh, that is not exclusive breastfeeding anymore. A bit of practical information now. Many family, uh, they are uh, giving exclusive breastfeeding only for four months after birth. They cannot even, uh, you know, continue for six months. And we, we uh, think it is not that, uh, you know, worrisome situation because still four months, the, the baby has already got exclusive breastfeeding. And after that, they can introduce the new food. This is just a practical information for you, okay? But according to Old Health Organization and UNICEF, uh, it should be given for six months and then only other food should be introduced. Now, demand feeding is one of the concept in case of breastfeeding. Now, demand feeding means when the baby demands feed, means when the baby is hungry, the baby will cry and then only the mother will feed the baby. This is called demand feeding. And another type of uh, feeding is known as a routine feeding. Routine. Every two to three hours, the mother feeds the baby. So these are the different ways. And complementary feeding means, every student knows now, giving other food and drinks in addition to the breast milk. 
Remember this always. I'm not saying replace the breast milk with other food. No. Give the breast milk or continue the breast milk, but uh, give other food as well. Okay, so let's move on. We are talking about different aspects of the breastfeeding now. We're talking about, okay, the nutritive value of the breast milk. So why breast milk is considered, you know, the absolutely necessary food for the baby in that duration. Why? What's the reason? Let's talk about it. Breast milk has a good, you know, amount of protein. The protein content in breast milk is around 1 to 1.1 gram per deciliter. Okay, 1 to 1.1 gram per deciliter. And if we go into the detail, regarding the constituents of protein there, we have lactalbumin and lactoglobulin and casinosin in the breast milk. And the ratio of them is 60 to 40. Casinosin, okay, is slightly uh, difficult to digest than lactalbumin and lactoglobulin. But, you know, this is a good thing here. Uh, why I'm saying this? Because the percentage of lactalbumin and lactoglobulin is higher than casinosin in case of breast milk. Okay. Another is fat. Look at the content of the fat here. 3.5 gram per deciliter is the fat. So good amount of fat is present in the breast milk. And among that fat, we have polyunsaturated fatty acid. This decreases atherosclerosis in the adult life, and it is very essential for myelination of central nervous system neuron uh, in case of pediatric age group. Without the myelination of central nervous system neuron, central nervous system is not matured. Remember this, for the maturation of those nerves, myelination is very essential, and that is helped by poorly unsaturated fatty acid, okay? It is present in a good amount in breast milk. There are minerals also present, okay? Minerals, like here, there is two to one calcium phosphorus ratio, which gives better absorption. Calcium is more than the phosphate. So this is a good thing. If phosphate is more than the calcium, probably the absorption of calcium will be poor. Another thing, it contains good amount of vitamin A, D, K, C, and zinc. Zinc is a type of micronutrient. And iron in breast milk has a very good bioavailability. Now, what is bioavailability? Yes? What is that? The bio, bioavailability is when, uh, 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 sir, when the iron is converted, but, sir, it, is, it, it goes directly into the blood circulation. of drugs sir, that can be... Uh, uh, it absorbed directly to the blood cell. Good. 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 So, see there, I'm getting different answers, but the meaning is right there. Okay. Very good. Well explained. If we give certain things, and what is the amount of that thing reaches the blood? That is called bioavailability. If we give uh, something from oral route, you know, how much it is absorbed? and how much is reaching in the blood. That is done as bioavailability. So iron in breast milk is very well absorbed. That means the bioavailability is very good in case of iron from the breast milk. Whereas iron from the cow's milk, okay, formula feeding and those type of, you know, sources of, uh, you know, iron, uh, whatever is present in the other forms of milk I'm saying, has a poor bioavailability than iron in breast milk. So, though the content of iron is lesser in breast milk, because of increased bioavailability, okay, it is balancing the things up there. This is important knowledge. Now, let's talk about some other importance of breast milk. There is higher concentration of secretory IgA, IgM, and lysozyme as well as anti-staphylococcal factor, complement, as well as interferon in the breast milk. All of these are protective for that baby. See this, the important one is secretory IgA because this is a secretion. Milk is a secretion from mammary gland of the mother. 
So in any type of secretion, we have IgA type of antibody, which is quite predominant. On the other hand, IgM and other types of antibody are also there. Okay, these are all protective factors. Breast milk has got bifidus factor, which uh, protects uh, the babies against E. coli, okay? which protects the baby against E. coli. So if E. coli is causing infection in the GI tract, uh, probably this bifidus factor, which is present in the breast milk, is uh, protecting. Now, the first you know, few uh, days, the breast milk, which is coming from the mammary gland, is called colostrum. This colostrum is slightly yellow and quite thick in nature. Now, this colostrum is absolutely necessary for the newborn baby. Now, so many parents, you know, they think colostrum is not good type of milk. So they, they, you know, don't give that milk to the baby. That is not a good thing to do. You, we must give colostrum. We must give stress to that colostrum, uh, you know, so that they give that to the baby, which is important. Why? Because it has got certain immunological basis. It has got living phagocytic macrophages and lymphoid cells uh, in a good amount which protect against diarrhea and other infection in the newborn. So we must promote for the feeding of colostrum. Now let's talk about other advantages of breastfeeding, which is a very important question for you in the exam. Breast milk protects from allergy. It protects from allergy. The secretory IgA, which is present in the breast milk, inhibit the absorption of macromolecule of protein thus reducing protein allergy. Protein is the most allergic substance, okay? If you compare between the different nutrients there, if you compare between the carbohydrate, fat, the nucleic acid, and the protein, proteins is the most allergic substance. So what, what that secretary Ig is doing, it is not allowing the absorption of protein. That's why it is, uh, you know, protecting from the allergy. This is especially important if we uh, feed some other uh, form of protein to the baby. Physiological adaptation, what does that mean? Breast constituents varies in preterm and term baby. Even malnourished babies have adequate milk supply. So sometimes the parents have a wrong impression that the milk uh, is not sufficient for my baby. My baby looks quite big. So milk may not be sufficient, okay? And if sometimes what they think the baby looks quite small, so mi milk may be too much for the baby. Nothing like that. The, the mammary gland can adapt according to the situation, according to the demand from the baby's side. So you don't need to worry about that. We just should promote breastfeeding. The more she tries, the more milk would come. So this, there is nothing like, uh, you know, breast milk is not enough. That means she is not trying harder. Yes, there are certain situations where breastfeeding is contraindicated. We'll talk about that later on. Apart from those situations, every mother must feed their baby with their breast milk. It is a crime if they don't feed. Remember the sentence, okay? It is a crime if they don't feed their baby with the breast milk. Now, another important advantage is emotional bonding between mother and the baby. If a mother is not feeding breast milk to the baby, that emotional bonding between the mother and the baby is not that well developed. But the mother develops tremendous amount of emotional bonding to her baby while breastfeeding. The feeling of being mother will be there during breastfeeding. Regarding the economic factors, okay, what does that mean? It is all about the finances, the money, breast milk, you don't need to pay anything for that. Just mothers need good nutrition, that's it. But if we compare this breast feeding or breast milk with the formula feeding, this is very expensive. Formula feeding means lactosin, remember? There are different other brands also, okay? Lactosin is just one of them. So you need to buy that, probably so many you know, packets of, uh, every month. So this is expensive. Now, what are the advantages to the mother or maternal health? There are so many advantages. 
let's go through them first is breastfeeding helps in uterine involution uh, what do you mean by uterine involution anybody can explain this the uterine involution yes. is the process uh, by transfer of uterine uh, from pregnant state to non-pregnant state from the, the, from the from the pregnant to non-pregnant state sir exactly very good the uterus is shrinking in size during pregnancy it is enlarged so much but after the baby is born you know uterus should uh, go back towards its pre pregnancy size that is known as involution now one of the hormone which is secreted during breastfeeding is oxytocin that oxytocin is helping the uterine involution this is the reason another is is it decreases the chances of postpartum hemorrhage pph postpartum hemorrhage again because of oxytocin oxytocin leads to active contraction of the uterine uterine muscle which decreases the chance of hemorrhage another advantage in the mother is breastfeeding gives protection against the pregnancy especially in first four month if she remains amenorrheic now let me clarify this a bit here if she is breastfeeding routinely you know almost every day routinely she doesn't need to use any other modality of contraception but if she misses the feeding if she mixes formula feeding with the breastfeeding if she is not feeding the baby regularly then this is not protective this is very very important point okay so it depends on her so if she Uh, absolutely needs to be sure that she is uh, not you know amenorrheic or she is not uh, you know having protection then another modality of contraception has to be provided now why why is this the prolactin hormone which is actively secreting while breastfeeding okay this prolactin hormone remember it has got certain uh, you know effect okay against the ovulation having said that the hormone which are related to the ovulations are inhibited by prolactin another important point okay this breastfeeding is time saving and cost effective for the mother definitely it doesn't take long time one breast feeding you know uh, takes around 10 to 15 minutes of time so within uh, half an hour the the baby get enough feeding we'll talk about that she should switch between the breast one breast should be fed uh, around 10 to 15 minutes and then only another breast should be fed okay so this is the way and this is highly cost effective actually there is no cost involved there less incidence of cancer of ovary and breast in the mother this is a huge advantage isn't it it's a very important point there is less incidence of cancer of ovary and breast if she is breastfeeding the babies so these are the maternal advantages now let's talk about what are the advantages to the baby see there emotional bonding the development and the growth of the baby would be far better higher iq level never forget this important point that's why we should promote for breastfeeding all over the world the baby who is regularly getting breastfeeding from the mother has got higher iq level Okay, we all know what is IQ, isn't it? It is the measure of intelligence. It is the measure of intelligence. There is less chance of allergic disease like bronchial asthma, like hay fever, like atopic dermatitis. All of these in the later life. So this is another huge advantage for that developing baby. And then there is a less chance of hypertension and even diabetes in the later life. Okay. different researches have have proven that so these are the definite benefit to the baby because of breastfeeding so as a pediatrician okay uh, uh we promote breastfeeding all the time okay, all the time this is the best feeding for the baby in the first 6 month of life or we 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 say uh, in the first 2 years of life now let's move further let's compare uh between human milk cow's milk and buffalo milk take a bit of time here see this please please
now why this comparison is important now let me give you some important points then we'll go to this table okay sometimes what happens you know towards the rural side uh, towards the village side uh, people believe cow's milk and buffalo milk are the best uh, even better than the human milk they think like that there is a certain reason why they think like that okay and at the end we should choose what is best for the baby regarding the protein see here there is 1 gram of the protein to 1.1 gram of the protein per 100 ml okay this is all percentage means per 100 ml so uh, in comparison cow's milk has three times more protein and buffalo milk has almost four times more protein so there is a high protein load in cow's milk and the buffalo milk and probably the ratio of these proteins also change uh, casinosin is a little bit higher than in human milk in this type of milk regarding the fat see here human milk and cow's milk have the same amount of fat but buffalo milk has almost double amount of fat so buffalo milk is highly nutritious if you uh, if you take the percentage of the fat only now one small question for you how much energy we get from carbohydrate protein and fat how much energy anyone how much kilo calorie of energy we get from 1 g of protein 1 g of carbohydrate and 1 g of fat that from carbohydrate we get sir 4 uh, kg uh, 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 per uh, per gram sir okay so let me let me clarify this it, it doesn't matter it's okay so from carbohydrate and protein we get 4 kilo calorie okay of energy 4 kilo calorie 1 g of protein and 1 g of carbohydrate give 4 kilo calorie of energy whereas 1 g of fat gives 9 kilo calorie of energy 9 remember this okay so if we want if we want our babies to gain weight we should include a good amount of protein as well as fat in the diet not only carbohydrate see here how much calorie does 100 ml of the milk contains human milk 67 cow's milk also 67 and buffalo milk around 80 220 average 100 you can remember like that so this is highly nutritious percentage of water is not very important almost the same lactose okay lactose is a type of carbohydrate 7 in human milk 5.5 in cow 4.8 in buffalo iron see that almost uh, a bit uh, similar similar form of iron but in buffalo milk it is slightly less vitamin a almost the same in all and vitamin c also almost the same in all okay though it is not written here uh, they also contains a certain amount of uh, these micronutrients now at the end what is the best for the human baby of course human milk is the best okay uh, we say often to those parents cow's milk is for cow's baby and human milk is for human baby just to make them you know understand sometimes you need to talk like that to make people understand what is the importance of human milk to the human baby so there is no doubt human milk has to be fed and it has to be promoted now what are the types of breast milk let's talk about it the first type of secretion which comes from the mammary gland or breast is called colostrum after the baby is born so it is secreted in the first week mainly in the first 3 days after delivery it is yellow and thick and it contains antibodies different types of wbcs and proteins okay antibodies wbcs mainly macrophages and the proteins that's why it is uh, highly encouraged we should encourage the you know uh, that uh, you know family to feed the colostrum to the newborn baby they should not discard it another type of breast milk is called transitional milk okay transitional milk it is secreted for the next 2 weeks after the colostrum and it has got proteins immunoglobulins and it has 
uh, you know, content while sugar and fat increases. So if we compare between the colostrum and this transitional milk, there's a slight uh, difference there. See here, proteins and immunoglobulins content decreases than colostrum, but sugar and fat increases than here. This is the transitional milk, only for the first two weeks. Now, mature milk, after that, it follows the transitional milk. It looks thinner and watery, but contains all the nutrients which are necessary for that newborn. It is again divided into two types of milk, fore milk and the hind milk. Now, fore milk means it comes in the beginning of the feeding. It comes in the initial part of the feeding. It is rich in water and it is also rich in sugar, protein, vitamin, and minerals. And the main importance of this four milk is it satisfies the thirst of the baby. So it satisfies the thirst of the baby. So let me underline this important point here. Along with that, it has got all the nutrients which are necessary. But what about the hind milk? Hind milk comes later, okay, later. It is rich in fat and it provides good energy. It provides satiety level to the baby. Now, satiety means the baby feels, okay, he or she doesn't want any milk now at this time. This is called satiety. This satiety is provided by fat, which is present in the hind milk. So this is a very important point. So let me, uh, you know, explain this uh, by giving one practical, you know, example. A mother after the delivery in the, you know, in third week after delivery is feeding her baby. Probably in the first five minutes of the feeding, okay, the baby has already satisfied the thirst because of poor milk. And after five minutes, the hind milk will start to come. And after that, the baby feels full. So this is the way. Let's move on. Now, another important point we like to talk in today's class is how to feed the baby, how to breastfeed. What is the correct positioning and what is the correct attachment of the mouth of the baby onto the breast? Now, trust me, many, uh, you know, mother, they don't know how to properly feed the baby. They don't know. And if they do not know how to feed the baby, there are lots of problems. Number one, the baby will remain hungry. And hungry baby is very irritable. Remember that the baby keeps on crying. And the baby, if the baby doesn't get good amount of milk, the baby may bite the nipple sometimes. The baby may bite the nipple. At that time, the baby doesn't have, you know, teeth. But with the gingiva, the baby may, you know, force on the nipple. So this is known as sore nipple. The nipple will become painful in this situation. And sometimes there is cracking of the nipple also develop, and that can attract the infection. So what I'm saying here, if the attachment and positioning is not proper, there is high chance of development of sore nipple, which can attract infection, and that infection can turn into breast abscess in the mother. And the baby will not also grow because baby is not getting enough milk. And this is very stressful situation for both baby and the mother. So as a result of this, what is the job of the pediatrician and the nurses in those hospital now? They should teach how to properly position the baby and uh, you know, uh, attach the baby onto the breast. Okay, now let's, let's come to the slide. These are the proper positioning of the baby while breastfeeding and they include supporting whole of a baby's body. Whole of baby's body, not only the head. Whole of baby's body should be supported. Ensure baby's head, neck and back are in same plane. The body should not fall down. Okay. They, are, they should be in the same plane. Entire baby's body should face the mother. This is important one. And baby's abdomen should touch the mother's abdomen. That means baby should be quite close to the mother. And this develops the bonding between mother and the baby. The baby should touch the mother. So this is called proper positioning. Correct positioning will ensure effective sucking 
and prevent the sore nipple and breast engorgement. Let's move on. Now, all of you, please focus on this picture here. See that, please. This is proper breastfeeding position and latch on. Latch on means, uh, you know, attachment. We'll talk about that later. Focus on the positioning now. Hold your baby, okay, with the whole body facing your body. See this? This is the very good way. Place your baby's nose and chin against your breast. This is uh, coming in the attachment and support your baby's head, neck, and back with another hand. This is the perfect way of positioning the baby. The baby's body should not fall, okay? Baby's body should not fall from here. The mother should not only support the head. This is the wrong way. And the baby must face the mother. Now, this is called attachment, okay? This is the attachment, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Now, what are the indicators of good attachment and positioning? We'll mainly focus on the attachment here, okay? Attachment means what? What is the, you know, connection between the mouth of the baby and the mother's breast? Mouth should be wide open. This is the first thing. Without a baby's mouth wide open, there should not, there uh, cannot be good attachment. Second, less areola is visible underneath the chin than above the nipple, means most of the areola should be inside the mouth of the baby. Second important point. Third, chin should touch the breast. Lower lip is rolled downwards and nose should become free. This is absolutely important. Chin should touch the breast, lower lip rolled downward and nose should become free. Now what many mother uh, will, will do the mistake is, the nose is blocked by the breast. And when nose is blocked, baby cannot breathe. Remember that because mouth is full by the breast now, areola. And if nose is also blocked, baby will become very irritable. That baby will not feed. So nose should become free. No breast should block the nose during breastfeeding. And there should not be any pain to the mother during good attachment. Now, look at this picture. Everything is crystal clear after, after seeing this uh, picture here. This one, a baby well attached to his mother's breast. Now, what are the points? What you saw here? And that uh, will tell you this baby is well attached to the mother's breast. Nose is free. You can clearly see her. Nose is free. Okay. Look at the lower lip. It is rolled. Okay. It is rolled downwards. Most of the areola is inside the baby's mouth. Okay, most of the areola is inside the baby's mouth. So this is a very good attachment. On the other hand, look at this and just compare. Where where is the lower lip here? It is not rolled downwards. Okay. It is not rolled downwards. Most of the areola is not inside the mouth of the baby. Only the nipple is inside the mouth, and this baby is only sucking the nipple. Milk is not going inside the baby's mouth. So what will happen now? For after some time, this nipple will develop, develop soreness. Okay, sore nipple we say. And after some time, it may attract the infection. So this is not a good attachment. So a good pediatrician and the nurses who are working in that center or the hospital should detect it quickly and teach the lady okay, how to properly position and attach the baby. And family member, there must be some experienced member in the family, isn't it? It is their job to teach how to properly breastfeed the baby. Now, let's move further. What are the important points for successful breastfeeding? Put to breast as soon as possible. As soon as possible means after the birth. Put to breast as soon as possible, half an hour after a normal delivery and not later than four hours after caesarean section. Or even after caesarean section, it should be as soon as possible. What does that mean? A lady should definitely feed the baby half an hour after normal delivery. She, she's fine if there is no complication during delivery, okay? 
And after cesarean, she may be drowsy. She may be under the effect of some sedation. So uh, she cannot breastfeed alone. Somebody should help her there. And in the hospital, of course, there are nurses to help. So even before four hours of cesarean section, the baby can be fed with the help of nurses. Give 10 to 15 minutes for each breast. This is important point. After the baby is happy with that breastfeeding, then switch to another one. No prelactial fluids are given. This is not a good thing. What do you mean by prelactial fluid? Yes? What are those? Uh, no uh, fluid given before uh, uh, breastfeeding. Exactly. Like water, you should not give any water to the baby. Like honey, you should not give uh, those type of things or any artificial feed. Okay? Exclusive breastfeeding for six months and then complementary fluid or food are given. After six months, we introduce some semi-solid or solid food to the baby. Uh, this is known as weaning. Okay. This is known as weaning. See here, period of weaning. Okay, And after that, breastfeed, breastfeeding should be continued along with other food. It should be continued till two years. Minimum duration is two years. But if, if the parents want even longer than that, they're welcome to do that. Let's move on. Now, let's, let's go to a bit of physiological aspect. What is the physiology of milk secretion? Which hormones are you know, coming into picture there? The most important hormone is prolactin. Prolactin leads to secretion of milk or formation of milk. Okay, prolactin. And from where prolactin is secreted? From where? Sir, pituitary gland. Anterior pituitary gland. Very good. Very good. It is from anterior pituitary gland. Excellent. Anterior pituitary gland. Pituitary gland has uh, two parts, anterior and posterior. It is coming from the anterior part. This is known as prolactin reflex or milk secretion reflex. You know, and what is the stimulus for that milk secretion is sucking by the baby. Now, this is important. When the baby is about to suck, okay, on the mother's nipple, this is a very strong stimulation for the secretion of prolactin. And, uh, you know, milk is synthesized there. That is one thing. But at the same time, even, even the thought about breastfeeding, even hearing the cry, of her baby means, you know, she thinks the baby is hungry now, the baby needs milk. So even by this type of stimulation, there is secretion of the milk. So this is very important point. But if she is under stress, okay, if she is under stress, if she is having pain somewhere in the body, then that will decrease the production of the milk. Now let's talk about oxytocin reflex here. This oxytocin reflex is called milk ejection reflex because oxytocin is the hormone which is the contractile type of hormone everywhere. Okay, so this is a milk ejection or let down reflex, and we need oxytocin for the uh, you know flow down of the milk. Because of the effect of oxytocin, the milk is ejected into the lactiferous sinuses and the duct. Okay. If this oxytocin is produced from posterior pituitary, we all know, actually, it is secreted uh, from uh, hypothalamus, but it is stored in the posterior pituitary and it is released from there in response to stimulation to the nerve ending in the nipple by suckling as well as by thought, by sight or sound of the baby. So both prolactin reflex and oxytocin reflex are helped by this different stimulation. If the lady is under tension or stress, under pain, if she is having lack of confidence, sometimes what happens in the primary, uh, you know, para, isn't it? For the first time, uh, she, she has given birth to the baby. She is a totally lack of confidence. She doesn't know how to feed the baby. And she has that type of feeling inside. That will hinder the flow of milk that will decrease the flow of milk. So we should boost our confidence. 
another important point feeding with bottle use of dummies pacifiers and those type of thing decrease the milk secretion so let me clarify this important point this is so common these days isn't it many of the parents they they think the milk is not enough so let's start with the formula feeding and they start bottle feeding after the baby is habituated with the bottle feeding okay the baby doesn't like to suck mother's nipple remember this because sucking mother's nipple or breast is a active type of process this is like exercise for the baby and okay so i was talking about why uh, the baby doesn't like to feed on the mother's breast milk after the baby is fed with bottle feeding or if we use a dummies excessively some dummy means you know when the baby is irritable or keep on crying sometimes what the parents do uh, they just put some nipple like things some artificial nipple like things in the mouth of the baby that is known as dummy these are absolutely not you know uh, you know good things for the breastfeeding practice now let me explain a little bit here breastfeeding is like active exercise for the baby just to compare with the adults what is the mentality of ours if we get certain things without doing hard work we always go for that the same type of concept is applicable here bottle feeding is it not active stress or active work for the baby the flow of milk from the bottle is far easier than the baby uh, who is uh, you know having breastfeeding okay that's why the baby always chooses bottle feeding over breastfeeding so what is the lesson learned here we should not even start the bottle feeding as far as possible some of the family of course there are some special situation where bottle feeding has to be started apart from them bottle feeding is not good in the pediatric age group let's move on now how we know the baby is getting enough milk what are the criteria to know there is adequacy of lactation during feeding okay during breastfeeding milk drips from contralateral breast if the lady is producing enough milk the milk flows from the other breast also now how you know baby satisfied satisfied baby becomes happy and playful and sleep at least 2 hours before crying for the next feed so at least 2 hours the baby will keep quiet the baby keep on playing or go to sleep that means this is a satisfied baby from the breastfeeding let's move on the baby is voiding urine at least 6 times or more per day six times in 24 hour period six times urination is very good one okay is a good uh, you know amount of urine production so the baby is only feeding the breast remember that the breast milk uh, what does that mean baby is not having any other source of the liquid or fluid so only breast breast milk is the source of fluid there so enough amount of urine output should be there and that is known by at least 6 times in 24 hour weight gain is satisfactory and breast feeds at least 8 times in 24 hour this is the adequacy of lactation 8 times in 24 hour means every 3 hour the baby is breastfeeding now i already told you in the beginning of this class there are two ways of breastfeeding one is demand feeding another is routine feeding demand when the baby cry when the baby is asking for a breast milk then the the mother should feed the baby this is demand another is a routine every 2 to 3 hour okay 3 hours would be better average milk production is 600 to 700 ml per day which is adequate for up to 5 to 6 month of life see there only breast milk is enough for that duration nothing else now let's go to another important part of this lecture what are the contraindication to breastfeeding in which situation we cannot you know continue breastfeeding there are certain absolute contraindication and certain relative 
absolute contraindication are mother and anti cancer drug mother and anti cancer drug anti thyroid drug or anti coagulant drug anti coagulants warfarin okay if mother is taking warfarin breastfeeding is contraindicated anti thyroid drug propyl thiouracil methimazole and carbimazole these are called anti thyroid drug okay propyl thiouracil methimazole and carbimazole and another important anti thyroid drug is radioactive iodine if mother is getting those breastfeeding is contraindicated and anti cancer you already know many example here bilateral breast abscess now this is contraindication to breastfeeding because of too much pain a lady cannot feed the baby because of pain in case of breast abscess and also there is a chance of rupture of the abscess okay and contamination of the baby if mother is having maternal illness like congestive heart failure uh, and she is getting desoxin acute renal failure and psychosis she cannot breastfeed the baby this is known as postpartum psychosis so let me write that term here for you what is the meaning of postpartum Yes. Postpartum. After, after delivery. Very good. After delivery. Excellent. Postpartum psychosis. Some of the lady, unfortunate lady, suffer from this type of condition, and you know they can even harm their baby. Sometimes they can even kill their baby because their uh, you know state of the mind is not proper. So, so we must isolate the baby from the mother. or somebody should watch watch them all the time there this is a very important situation tracheoesophageal fistula in the baby what is the danger of breastfeeding in tracheoesophageal fistula anybody aspiration sir aspiration aspiration respiration swall swallowing of exactly this is known as aspiration very good answer there is a risk of aspiration pneumonia now see there there are different types of tracheoesophageal fistula you have already studied that before okay many different types are there so some in some type the milk will directly go to the trachea directly in some type there is filling of that blind tube and then when it is filled the milk will spill over uh, into the trachea so all these things are there so it is contraindicated galactosemia is another important situation where breastfeeding is contraindicated okay galactose is present in the breast milk now galactosemia is a situation where galactose cannot be converted into glucose because of the lack of the enzyme so galactose will remain as a galactose and that can be quite damaging for the baby's brain especially other organs are also affected there like reticular endothelial system liver okay and even the nerves relative contraindication would be hepatitis b hiv and tuberculosis hepatitis b hiv and tuberculosis all of these are relative contraindication relative means if we have got some other options of feeding we can go for those options but if we do not have better to continue to breastfeed that is the meaning of relative if active tuberculosis is there in the mother give inh 10 mg per kg per day for 3 month okay to the baby just this is called prophylactic therapy prophylactic therapy to the baby infants with phenyl ketonuria is also relative contraindication now phenyl ketonuria is a very interesting situation where phenyl alanine cannot be converted into tyrosine now what is phenyl alanine and tyrosine what type of substance are they say amino acid they are amino acid very essential. good essential amino acid very good they are amino acids okay they are essential amino acid excellent so what happens here phenyl alanine cannot be converted into tyrosine so phenyl alanine remains as phenyl alanine here and this phenyl alanine will be converted into some abnormal metabolite like phenyl 
lactic acid a phenyl pyruvic acid a phenyl pyruvic acid and phenyl acetic acid phenyl acetic acid all of these are quite damaging substance for the different organs of that baby as a result of this there is damage to the developing brain which may lead to mental retardation as well as seizure uh, and there is damage to the development nervous system and other component of the body as well okay phenyl ketonuria try to remember this the enzyme which is absent there is called phenyl alanine hydroxylase let's move on so these are very important question for you in the exam now today I'm going to talk about some of the very important concept that is mother to child transmission of HIV. Now, how a baby gets HIV? Let's talk about that first. Okay. How a baby gets HIV? Definitely the most common way is from the mother. The most common way is from the mother. Now, at what time the baby gets HIV? From the mother. Now, see there. Okay, let's talk about this first. One is during pregnancy, when the baby is developing inside the uterus. During that time itself, the baby may be infected because that HIV virus can easily cross the placenta. Okay, that is in the intrauterine period. So let me write these things here. Then we'll move further. Okay, please pay attention. One is during intrauterine period. Now, the second important time when the baby gets infection from the mother is at the time of birth. At the birth, okay? And third is from breastfeeding. Never forget this. This is very important knowledge for you. So these are the three important way. Now, out of them, the most common is at the time of birth. There's no doubt about it. Now, with this knowledge, let's come to this slide here. This is the timing of HIV transmission, and this is a transmission rate. During pregnancy, okay, or during the intrauterine period, the transmission rate is five to 10%. During labor and delivery, it is 10 to 15%. During breastfeeding, it is five to 20%, okay? Though it looks like the percentage is a bit higher in the breastfeeding, but this is quite a big range, isn't it? So still we say during labor or delivery, there is a highest chance of transmission of HIV. Now, let's talk about something else. Overall, uh, you know, uh, Timing of transmission without breastfeeding rate is 15 to 25% without breastfeeding. Okay, this is overall. Overall with breastfeeding up to six months, up to 35%. And overall with breastfeeding up to 18 to 24 months, means up to two years is 30 to 45%. Now, what information you get okay, from this data? Is breastfeeding allowed during, uh, you know, uh, HIV in the mother or not? Yes, what is the answer? Not allowed, not sir. Allowed. No allowed. Not allowed, sir. Not allowed, okay? Very good. Everybody would, would answer like that, okay? Because we have not discussed any other till now. After going through this slide, everybody should answer in the same way. That means, if possible, don't breastfeed the baby. Okay, uh, from the mother who is having HIV positivity. Don't do that because there is a high chance of transmission up to 30 to 45 if she continue to breastfeed up to 24 months. This is the uh, you know, point. But there are so many other things we have to discuss in today's class. Number one, this data doesn't consider the use of antiretroviral drug. Okay. There is no mentioning of any antiretroviral drugs there. If we start antiretroviral drug during the pregnancy itself, then the chance of transmission to the baby is less. 
number one. Number two, if we deliver the baby by cesarean section, the chances is again less. Okay, so these are the two very important way. Starting antiretroviral drug during pregnancy and delivering the baby by cesarean section are the two excellent way to decrease the chance of HIV transmission from the mother towards the baby. Okay, now another thing uh, we need to consider is breastfeeding. Now, as far as possible, breastfeeding is not, you know, advisable uh, to the uh, baby from HIV positive mother, but WHO or World Health Organization has its own idea. What WHO tells us, okay, there are so many other illnesses in the developing country like diarrhea, pneumonia, measles, okay, malaria, malnutrition, all of them are far more important killer than HIV infection. And breastfeeding is probably the most important factor which is preventing those baby from getting those diseases. So WHO still believe the lady should continue to breastfeed even if she is HIV positive. Okay, so we may not we may not agree with the, you know WHO's recommendation here, but having said that, okay, from the pediatrician's point of view, what we do is we talk very nicely to the family, especially to the parents. We counsel them what is the danger if they continue to breastfeed, if they afford the formula feeding, okay? If they afford the formula feeding for a long duration, if they know the importance of these things, if they are well educated, then we don't advise them to go for breastfeeding. On the other hand, if they are from relatively, you know, poor, uh, you know, socioeconomic background, after a few months, they will again go back to the breastfeeding and those type of things then it is quite damaging. Mixed feeding is very damaging rather than only one type of feeding. So according to the situation, you know, uh, the parents should be counseled, okay? So with this, uh, let me move further. We'll talk about all those things in today's class. Now see here. The increased risk of contracting the disease in the presence of you know following factors. What are those risks? I mean to say, what are the increased risk of contracting HIV by the baby? What are those factors? If they are present, the risk is higher. Number one is a mixed feeding. What do you mean by mixed feeding? Yes, what is mixed feeding here? Formula feeding, breast feeding. Exactly, breastfeeding and artificial feeding together. You know, sometimes what, what most of the family do, you know, this is what they are doing actually. Let's talk a bit of practical things here. So sometimes the lady is too tired, isn't it? She doesn't want to breastfeed her baby. She just, you know, gives the baby formula. Everything is, is okay. We can accept that if, if both of them are healthy. But in this situation, we are talking about HIV positive mother. So she, she should never mix the two things together. There is a very important reason for this. Listen properly. The protein load is very high in the formula feeding. The amount of protein is higher there. So that protein should be digested and absorbed from the GI tract of the baby. And during that process, there would be some inflammation going on there may be some damage on the intestinal mucosa. Now, at the same time, if the lady is switching to breastfeeding now, there are HIV viruses present in her breastfeeding. And then that HIV can easily enter into the baby's blood through that damaged intestinal epithelium. That's why you should not okay, mix these two feedings together. Always remember this, okay? Just one, either formula or only the breast. When maternal immunity is low and viral load is high, there is increased risk of contracting the disease by the baby. This is all about viral load. With breast problem in the mother, like mastitis, cracked nipple, 
and breast abscess, there is high chance of transmission of HIV to the baby. Why? Because, okay, the blood uh, may be there on those surfaces and that blood can easily enter into the baby's body. The longer the duration of breastfeeding, higher the chance. And with oral or gut problems in the baby, like thrush and ulcer, there is easy entrance of HIV into the blood of the baby. So in the presence of this factor, there is a higher chance of getting HIV by the baby. These are the meanings. Now, what are the risks associated with not breastfeeding? The YWHO is still recommending for the continuation of breastfeeding by HIV positive mother because of these things. See there? There is a risk of diarrhea if we do not breastfeed our babies. And that may be because of unclean water or leftover milk for a longer time. There is a high chance of getting malnutrition by feeding insufficient or diluted milk and by uh, you know, if the baby gets recurrent episodes of diarrhea, then there is a chance of malnutrition. And another one, there is a high chance of pneumonia. I already talked about this. So because of this, and these are a very important killer in those babies from the developing world, WHO still recommend to continue to breastfeed by HIV positive mother. But we don't, you know, uh, uh, agree with this in 100% of the time. We have our own idea here. Okay? If the a family can afford formula feeding. If they know the importance of these things, then they can safely go for formula feeding in case of HIV positive mother. Now, give special counseling to the HIV positive mother who chooses breastfeeding. Now, what are these important counseling? Support the mother in her choice of breastfeeding. Do not criticize her. Do not tell her Oh, you have done, made the wrong choice. How can you breastfeed your baby uh, when you are HIV positive? We should never talk like this. We should always, you know, encourage her. Yes, your decision is right. And we should tell why the decision is right. We should not criticize the decision. This is against the law of, uh, you know, counseling. Ensure good attachment and sucking to prevent mastitis and nipple damage. Remember the discussion of positioning and attachment, you know, this is the good attachment. If good attachment is not there in the breast, there is a real chance of sore nipple development, then infection, which is known as mastitis, then even breast abscess. So we should avoid it. Advise mother to return immediately if she has breast symptoms or signs of the baby has difficulty to feed. There may be a chance of infection. And remember, when there is an infection in the breast, there is high chance of... Please mute yourself. Otherwise, I will you know, I'll not allow that student to join again. Now see that? So advise mother uh, to return immediately if she has breast symptom or sign or the baby has difficulty feeding because there's a chance of higher infection to the baby if there are certain uh, conditions in the breast, especially the infection. Arrange for further counseling to prepare for the possibility of stopping a breastfeeding early. So these are some of the important points. Okay. Now, let's move further. Now, this is a very important topic, so please uh, pay attention. What are the obstetric factors which favor HIV transmission? If mother is having, you know, those things, then there is a higher chance of HIV transmission to the baby. What are those? One is preterm delivery. Another is a vaginal delivery. Third, premature rupture of membrane for more than four hours. Fourth, chorioamnionitis, and fifth, use of invasive fetal monitoring device. Now, let us, uh, you know, clarify these important points here. Preterm delivery, okay. There must be certain risk factor then 
there is a preterm delivery, isn't it? Without certain risk factor, preterm delivery, sometimes it is idiopathic, we all know that. Sometimes it just happens, but most of the time there are certain risk factor. And as a result of those risk factor, there is a high chance of HIV transmission. That is one reason. And another, preterm babies, okay, their immunity is so low in comparison to the full-term baby. So they can easily get those infection. Vaginal delivery has higher chance of HIV transmission than cesarean section because of the high risk of contamination. So as far as possible, we should always deliver the baby by cesarean section if the mother is HIV positive. Now let's talk a bit of practical thing here. Sometimes the doctor and the nurses, they don't want to do cesarean section and that is not a professional thing to do. We should protect ourselves and still go for the surgery. Premature rupture of membrane for more than four hours can lead to higher chance of HIV transmission. What is chorioamnionitis? What do you mean by this? Bacterial infection Bacterial before or uh, uh, between the chorion and... Exactly. The risk caused by using chorionic and amniotic membrane. That's not for me, it's the risk caused by. Exactly. This is intrauterine infection during pregnancy. Intrauterine infection during pregnancy, known as chorioamnionitis, the membranes are, you know, uh, infected here. And in this situation, the mother may get fever, there is a foul smelling discharge, okay, and there is a very high risk of HIV transmission on top of it because the surface is raw everywhere. The raw surface can easily lead to entry of the virus in the body. Use of invasive metal monitoring device. Invasive fetal monitoring device, invasive term is here. And where, wherever there is invasion, there is a contact with the blood, so there is no transmission. Okay, so always give some reason so that you can remember this for a longer time. Another important concept, what is the recommendation to decrease the transmission during pregnancy? I already talked about this. What can we do to decrease the HIV transmission during pregnancy? We will start anti retroviral drug. Okay, I'm sure you have already studied this in pharmacology. What are the examples of those antiretroviral drugs? Uh, uh, nucleoside reverse transcription inhibitors. Yeah, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. We can use protease, protease inhibitors and... Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. So we have, uh, I'm sure many other students can also answer this, okay? Just to, just for the sake of revision, let me take those names quickly. Nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Okay, sorry. Can you see it? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Wait one minute. Now? Can you see now? No, sir. Still, Still not. not. No, sir. Wait. Now I'm sure you can see, right? Yeah. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. Now see that what I'm talking here is, uh, what are those antiretroviral drugs which can be uh, you know, used during HIV infection? Let's talk a bit of general things first, and then we'll, we'll come on to the uh, pregnant state. So one is NRTI, okay, NRTI. And the common example in NRTI, you can see here is Zydobudine. Okay. Zydobudine is a very important drug in NRTI. Another is, NNRTI, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Nevirapine is one of the important drug there. Third is protease inhibitor. Okay, protease inhibitor. Okay, indanavir, sacovinavir, okay, ritonavir. These are the important drugs under protease inhibitor. So these three are the most important drug. And another uh, classification is also there, which are known as fusion inhibitor these days. But uh, these three 
are the very, very important drug. These are also known as highly active antiretroviral drug or also known as H-A-A-R-T therapy, heart therapy, okay? Now, let's come to the point. Zydovudine is one of the excellent drug which is used, okay? 100 milligram orally five times per day and it is started from 14th week of the pregnancy onward throughout the whole pregnancy and even, you know, during labor, it is continued, okay? And after a labor also, it is given uh, in the newborn for certain duration. This is how we decrease the risk of HIV transmission in the baby. Okay, this is the way. Now, during labor also, a similar type of drugs is given. Now, what we do in the newborn now, okay? In the newborn, the baby is born now. What should be done? Treatment is started at eight to 12 hours of age after birth. And again, the baby is treated with Zydovudine at two milligram per kg every six hour. You don't need to remember the dose, just remember the name of the medicine. And the important point here, the medicine should be continued till the confirmation of HIV negative status. Now, how to confirm the baby is HIV negative? Let me hear some answer here. How to confirm? Anyone? By doing uh, PCR. Good. One is PCR. Good answer. Any and, other? And we can use a uh, ELISA test. Yes, it's a test. Yes. Which test? Now, Listen this, this may be a bit of a difficult question for you. So let me, you know, share by myself. In adult, okay, when we want to confirm HIV infection in adult, we go for ELISA and Western blot. ELISA and Western blot test. These are the two tests which is done in case of adult. And both of these will utilize antibody detection, antibody detection against HIV. Remember this, these are in adults. But in children, what is the, uh, you know, uh, point against it? Remember the baby is having a, a IgG antibody, which is coming from the mother. And this IgG antibody can last there for a long time. According to the textbook, it can last there till 18 months. Till 18 months, the IgG antibody can last. And this IgG is coming from the mother. Okay. Now, what is the best investigation then? That best investigation is PCR. PCR will not detect antibody. PCR will detect antigen. So we want to detect this antigen as early as possible within the first few weeks of life. Then if that HIV is negative, then we can safely discontinue the medicine. But if there is no facility of the PCR, then the baby has to be given this medicine till 18 months till you know, the ELISA and Western blood test are negative. Now we have come towards the end of this topic. After talking all those HIV, you know, transmission from the mother to the baby, let's talk about what we do if the mother is having active tuberculosis. Active tuberculosis means sputum positive tuberculosis, okay? Uh, so what should we do? Now there are two situations here. One is sick baby, another is well baby. In case of sick baby, there may be some symptoms already fever and failure to thrive. So in this situation, we give full course of treatment to the baby. Like we think the baby has already got a tubercular infection. So treat the baby as the tuberculosis patient and hold BCG at this time. You don't need to give BCG now. But if the baby is well till now, then give six months of INH or isoniazid 
or you can give prophylaxis of INF for three months and then after three months you do tuberculin test. What is tuberculin test? Sir, it's an immunity test which we can use for uh, tuberculosis and it's type 4 related hypersensitivity uh, uh, test. Okay. Mentox test. It is used for tuberculosis, sir. Exactly. This is a MAN2, MAN2 test or tuberculin test uh, or PPD test. It has got different terms there. And remember, it is done to make sure whether the person is predisposed or already infected with TB bacilli or not. So what we are doing here for the three months, we are providing INS to the baby. And after three months, you do tuberculin test. Now, according to the uh, you know interpretation, you are doing other things. Now see this, if the tuberculin test is negative, you stop INS and give BCG vaccine after three months. But if tuberculin test is positive, you continue INS for another three months. So this is the way we manage, you know, uh, uh, the baby uh, who is breastfeeding from active tuberculous mother. Or in other words, if the mother is having a sputum positive type of tuberculosis, and if she is breastfeeding her baby, this is the way to manage. Continuation of breastfeeding is controversial, okay? Because there is a high chance of infection, but still some of the, you know, pediatrician, uh, some of the, you know, um, academy uh, still uh, want to continue the breastfeeding. And the reason is still the same because without breastfeeding, there is high chance of mortality in the baby by those dreadful infections of the diseases, okay? Uh, so we should continue to breastfeed and put the baby under chemoprophylaxis by NH, or if the baby is already infected, let's go for the full treatment. This is Indian Academy of Pediatrics, okay? IAP, Indian Academy of Pediatrics. It uh, recommends to continue breastfeeding here. Yeah. 